Are you a 3PL spending more time and money than you'd like recruiting and onboarding logistics roles? Then it's time to check out Rapido Solutions Group, the leaders in nearshore logistics staffing. Located right next door in Mexico, they have access to the freight talent you need. From carrier sales to tracking and tracing and everything in between, they can do the heavy lifting for you. So if you're ready to get your time back and want to move fast, check out Rapido Solutions Group. Visit GoRapido.com to get started today. Have you heard about Bitfreighter and the EDI revolution? Bitfreighter helps companies automate communication with their freight partners through unlimited messaging and quoting. Traditional providers can't say that. The Bitfreighter team is also available 24-7 and responds immediately by phone, email, or yes, even text. Legacy providers can't say that either. So if you want to scale your operations to save time and money, come join the EDI revolution with us. Visit bitfreighter.com to get started today. Hello, and welcome to the Bootstrapper's Guide to Logistics, the podcast highlighting founders doing it the way that doesn't get a lot of attention. We're here to change that by sharing their stories and inspiring others to take the leap. It's a roller coaster ride that you might ultimately fail. That's when I kind of knew I was on to something. It was very hard. It truly is building a legacy. The more life you live, the more wisdom you have. Because we are where we're supposed to be, kind of answering the call. Don't shoulder entrepreneurship on your own. I'm your host, Nate Schutz. Let's build something together from the ground up. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the show. This week, we're going to go deep into Final Mile and the gig economy, talking about e-commerce deliveries, food deliveries, and all things uh, Last Mile with Chris Heffernan. Chris is the founder and CEO of Delivered, based in Philadelphia. Chris, you may have the most unique distinction of like founder origin stories in that you're the only founder I know whose story started with a cheesesteak. Uh, <laughs> welcome to the show, by the way. <laughs> I want to I wanna know what that's all about. But can, we, can you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what you do? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks for the intro, Nate. Thanks for having me on... Uh on the podcast here. It's super excited. Um, Chris Heffernan, founder and CEO delivered. Like you said, we're based in, uh, here in Philadelphia. We are last mile technology, uh, that connects brands with delivery drivers in 152 markets across the U S and Canada used primarily in the restaurant industry for large format catering orders, but we also power some on demand, some routed delivery, some e-commerce, uh, kind of anything that puts high quality earnings into drivers' pockets and allows mm. them to kind of schedule their day uh, and, and you know, make a little bit more than their traditional, you know, pick up a, a burger and drop it off at a customer. Oh, that was going to be one of the distinctions I was going to ask you about, because I know the individual meal delivery, door dashes and et cetera, it's a very, very difficult business model. It's so hard to scale. And the cost of the service now, you know, in a lot of places exceeds the cost of the food. And people are willing to pay for convenience to a point, but it sounds like, let's just go full logistics nerd here. <laughs> you're you're basically doing meal delivery, like consolidated because it's catering. And so it's for large groups going to one location instead of, you know, one meal to one house. Yeah, yeah. Majority of what hits our platform is those corporate offices that are feeder, feeding 10, 20, 30 people or more. Uh, now with, you know, uh, a return to work environment or people coming back into the office where once feeding people was kind of a perk, it has almost now become more of a requirement. Mm. Not only have we seen the amount of orders per address increase in frequency, we've also seen it increase in food subtotal and order count. So uh, as businesses are, you know, pulling people probably like kicking and screaming back into the office, they're at least feeding them. So, and we're here to power that last mile from restaurant to those offices, you know, for those, for those employees. So tell me about the infamous cheesesteak then. Yeah. So, uh, you know, like you said, I'm from the Philadelphia area, right? Like, I, I don't know how much of me is conveyed here, but like, I'm a bigger guy, right? I love <laughs> eating food. That's why I'm in food tech. Uh, so I'm on vacation in Delray Beach, Florida, which is right outside of West Palm. And I'm driving down the road and I saw a sign for Big Al's Philly cheesesteak, right? And there's a huge misconception in my mind about cheesesteaks. So like when you go to Subway and they're like, get the Big Philly and it has like peppers <laughs> and like all this other junk on it, right? That's not a, that's not a Philly cheesesteak. A Philly cheesesteak is a roll 
like ribeye, cheese, and onion. And you don't have to get the onion if you don't like it. But none of that other like no may like no mayo, no peppers, traditional like cheese steak. So I was like, you know what? I gotta I gotta check and make sure this dude's legit, right? Plus I was hungry. So in Philly, the way it works, like you order your cheese steak at one window, your fries and your soda at another window. They did that. They use Lissio's Rolls, which is a bakery here in Philadelphia. Uh, they overnighted the rolls down every night for like the next day. And this is back in 2011, right? So we're going, we're going back away in our time machine. And uh, it was a legit cheesesteak. Big Al was from South Philly, hated the cold, went to Florida, was like, this is a cheesesteak desert. And opened it up. So sitting there and I'm talking with Big Al, I see a a sticker on the window. It says, we deliver with delivery dudes. And I'm like, Big Al, what, like what's delivery dudes? And he's like, oh, it's great. It's these kids. They deliver for all the restaurants up and down the strip. Uh, They take a commission off the order, but they handle all that stuff. So I'm like, cool. So I dug into it. I'm looking at their website, looking back home. All there is is Grubhub, pizza, Chinese, restaurants that deliver themselves. This is before DoorDash. This is before Uber Eats. I'm like, I could do this. This would be cool. So I come home, I buy a shoe website that's made to sell sneakers. And instead of selling a Nike size 12, I have it, you know, I learned some HTML and I'm selling a burger at American cheese, right? Mm. I sign up my first restaurant. I was so excited at 8%, an 8% discount. Sales tax in Pennsylvania is 6%. So just 2% more than the state makes for doing nothing I was getting 8% for actually going and picking up the food, the whole shebang, but I was jazzed, right? And you compare that now to like Uber Eats and Grubhub and those guys that charge 30, 35%, right? Like joke was on me. Sign for restaurants. I'm driving around in my leased Toyota Camry, slinging some food that turned into 50 restaurants in the suburban Philadelphia area, expanded a little bit there. And, you know, that's, that's basically where the cheesesteak brought me. To do that, I, I mean, I'm already imagining, well, one, that the Camry is an underrated, you know, highly functional. It's not sexy. I've had several of them in my day, and uh, it gets the job done. And in, in logistics, your reliability is maybe more important than having a spoiler on your car. But to, to get started like that, you shared a little bit of your background with me beforehand. And I know you you had to, you went all in financially on this. You did not tiptoe your way in you you bankrolled this with some pretty creative uh, finance how did you how did you decide to make that choice yeah so uh before this i worked uh worked for a large telecommunications company for nine years in regional management and uh, i got a new boss came down from new york and the guy was a jerk like was quoting sun tzu the art of war like cutting off the head of the concubines and i'm like i i don't want to do this anymore right so i just walked into his office and it was like a scene from a bad cop movie. Like, here's my gun and my badge, except it was an ID (laughs) card and an iPad, right? Like dropped it on the table. Like, like I'm out, you know? And uh, so I walked out of there, no notice, no nothing, cashed out my 401k and just, just went for it. Like a couple missed mortgage payments later, you know, the only money I was making was, you know, the tips on the orders that I would deliver because everything else was going back to the company for insurance for that Camry you know, all these other expenses. So it was, it was a grind for the first, you know, the first few years. And then it finally stabilized a bit. And ironically, once it started to stabilize, that's when Uber Eats and DoorDash were really ramping up. And then they both identified like this area in suburban Philadelphia as like a hot zone. So they were like, drivers, restaurants, like this is where it is. Basically what I did, I primed the market for them in suburban Mm. Philadelphia because these restaurants were already comfortable with a third party delivery. Customers were already comfortable ordering on an app. What was like before when I'd walk into a restaurant, I would get, this is the worst idea. I'm never going to do anything like this. Like you're an idiot and friends, like I'm not going to use my own car to make money right now. Look at the gig economy. So they just, at that point, they just kind of like decimated me. So you went all in and then you get massive competition from, I'm not going to say companies with unlimited funding, but companies that can operate for a long time without generating a profit. How did you navigate through that disruption of of an entire industry and keep any sense of sanity or, or hope that you were going to be able to compete? 
Well, there was definitely not a lot of sense of sanity there, right? So there was a lot of a lot of fleeting moments of insanity. Is this the right decision? I'm delivering food. You know, it was it was a lot of rough choices, but kind of like in in the worst of the moments, there was one day I'm out doing the delivery because again, the only money that I was making was on those tips. And I'm picking up from like a large chicken conglomerate. And they're like, Hey man, I love that you're sending me these $25 lunch order or these $25 orders. Right. But I need help moving my farm rep orders. I get a bunch of these going in the same direction. Like, can you help with that? And I'm like, I don't, I don't see why not. Like I can send drivers here. Like they don't have to order for me. I don't have to do anything. He's like, no, they order. We just need it moved. And I'm like, huh? Yeah, let's do that. So we ran a trial in Philadelphia with like eight of their locations, just being the logistics engine where before in the first business, I had an app, I had to market to get customers. I had credit card processing, all these other fees. And now this restaurant was like, Hey, no, you don't have to do any of that. I just need you to show up on time and deliver on time. I'm like, cool. So meanwhile, I'm getting pummeled on these other orders, but here's this lifeline, right? Like this GM from this one store literally like plucked me from a sea of disparity without even really knowing it, just, you know, in conversation. So I took that. I'm like, I could do more of this. So we started pitching some other restaurants in the Philly area. Like, Hey, like, would this be of interest to you? And we got a couple that were like, yeah, I basically went on Craigslist and searched under jobs like catering delivery. Mm. And anybody that had a job post for catering delivery, I started reaching out like, hey, I see you're looking for a catering driver. How would you like a whole fleet of them? That's so simple. It's not It's not this high-minded Ivy League management consulting strategy. What you said earlier just jumps out. Like if you can pick something up on time and you can deliver it on time, that's the basis for the entire industry. And yet we overcomplicate it endlessly. And here you are, you know, plunking away on Craigslist looking for lead. And I, I, I would have never have thought of that. I mean, how did you, you, you seem to have a creative way of, of tackling problems and you don't seem, but when you encounter a barrier, you don't seem to be um, scared of it. Like, what were you like as a kid? Like, how did, how did you get to that place? A lot of bad decisions and mistakes. I, I don't know. Using my skill to make creative decisions in the wrong light, you know. <laughs> oh, okay, let's. There's, yeah, there's a lot. I don't know what the statute of limitations on things are, but <laughs> no, it's just. I mean, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I, I get asked the question a lot, like how do, like how do you, like how does your brain work with like a quip like that or a joke or how do you, you know, how do you think this? And ultimately, I think it's like when your back's up against the wall, like what's your option, right? Like, and my option was to like, just run through that wall. So I, if I, I needed, I saw that this was a way out and like, what's, where do people go when they're looking for jobs? It's like Craigslist. It doesn't cost me any money in SEO. I didn't have any uh -huh. money anyway. It doesn't cost me any money in finding email marketing, a consultant, a sales rep commissions, like no. And, and it, and it worked. Right. And I found, a great restaurant partner. We still work with them today in, in the Northeast of Philadelphia called Sweet Lucy's Barbecue. And they pump out a ton of barbecue. And they were the, the first independent restaurant I signed under the kind of new brand. Because what we did was we took that old business, which was called Food Cab, and we just shut that down. And all the apps and the technology at the time that existed, and we're talking, this is 2018, we fast forwarded in our time machine. Uh, it was all for like on demand orders. Like I want it. I want it now. Like you're on fleets and apps like that. Uh -huh. So I bought some base code from a firm in India. And then I hired a guy on Upwork to kind of like make it what I wanted to work for pre-scheduled orders. And we ran with that for a number of years until we were able to kind of, you know, build our, build our own technology stack, which is what we use today. But that barbecue place came in and it was like, it was a big change for them because they'd use their own W2 employees and now they were using contractors. But on a good Saturday, they'll dump, I don't know, $20,000 worth of catering out onto the streets in the summer. So like, and we're there fueling those orders. So it's great. So the, let's you mention W2s and contractors, the whole gig economy emergence in the last decade has been all about don't have employees only have 1099s you don't have to pay them benefits there's all you know it's a, a cheaper model 
but it comes with some downsides, doesn't it? Yeah, it, it like uh, the lack of control, the lack of ability. The one question we always get in the calls, like, will your will your drivers show up in uniform? And I'm, like, sometimes I'm like, you're lucky if they're wearing pants. Like, <laughs> <laughs> they're they're contractors, right? Like, and we've seen it. Your DoorDash order and the drivers in pajamas. Right? Yeah. Like, but then you also get drivers that show up in like a black polo and black slacks because they're used to working in the restaurant industry. So it comes with its fair share of problems. But if it's I don't want to say managed right because you can't manage it, but if it's handled correctly, you can get a good team mm-hmm. out of gig workers if you put the right stuff into it. If you want to if you want to treat them as gig workers because the government says that they're less than an employee, then you're going to get exactly that. But if you want to humanize it a bit and make them a part of the team and you know get their buy-in, then you could have, you know, a good workforce out there. Like our marketing team is split. We have two different sides of our marketing team. One is to market to clients to get brands and their attention. And the other is to get the attention of the drivers. Because at the end of the day, we're trying to get the driver to buy into taking an order from Mm. us. They have to swipe right to accept that order. They have the ability to say no. So we need to make it attractive, like a Tinder date where it's like, yeah, I want to swipe right on that. So we're trying to pair the driver and gain their buy-in to these orders. Well, then it moves beyond being just a transactional relationship. And if you take care of the driver, then they'll take care of the customer, regardless of what the legal designation is. I I think you hit the nail on the head, like humanizing the people that are interacting with the end customer. If if you take care of them, they will take care of the next um, rung and... That's actually a sustainable business model. The you're you're less than because the government decides that I don't have to treat you or pay you a certain way. Therefore, you're you're less than an, a full time employee. Actually, feels dehumanizing. Yeah, yeah, and and it like it carries into so many other things too. You look at it like unions exist to make sure that we treat workers well. But if you treated your workers well, they wouldn't want to unionize. Like they wouldn't need to. Yeah. Right. Like, so it's like, just do the right thing. Like throw a rock and a ri- or throw a rock at a lake in the ripple. If that original rock is a rock of good and treating people well, that ripple is going to cascade out. They're going to treat the customer well. The customer is going to reorder. So the client's going to be happy, which means the driver is going to get more orders, which means they're going to treat the customer well again because they're happy and they have more orders. And that ripple just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger and everybody benefits. But if you throw that rock out there and you're treating them dehumanized or treating them Mm -hmm. poorly, you're going to have that negative ripple effect. That's where I think it's fascinating, the short-term versus long-term thinking on business ethics. In the short term, you can make a lot more money uh, cheating people or or, or doing unfair practices. But long-term, you can't grow past a certain point because as you you throw that rock into the water and the ripples spread, this is for being as uh, how many tens of thousands of people and trillions of dollars of trade are happening, it's still a very small world. Reputations still matter. And sometimes if you see a company that's capped on its growth, it's because the market knows who they are and doesn't want to engage with them anymore. And if you do business the right way, those ripples just keep growing and growing. And I mean, for you, you're how many cities are you in now? 152 metros or like... So like DMA, so like DC Metro is technically three cities, but one market for us. So okay, how many markets are you like in then? 152 like markets okay. in the US and Canada. So, you know, a good widespread area. How many food deliveries a week or a day does that turn into? Thousands of thousands a day, tens of thousands a week. That's bonkers. Yeah. It's absolutely bonkers. Right. It, 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 it's a lot of personalities to manage between the, the employees in the building that manage the relationships with, you know, the drivers and then the drivers themselves. Right. So it's just, it's a lot. And then the clients. So everybody well, asks, right. should I start a delivery business? And I'm like, no, it's horrible. But like, <laughs> I'm too far into it now to give up. Like, You're committed. I, Right. Yeah. 70 some full-time workers, uh, tens of like eh, 15, 20,000 drivers. Like there's no, there's no turning back now. Well, speaking of personalities, you, you, you've got a big one yourself. What, what, what was your family like, life like, and did, 
wh where did you learn to communicate so effectively? Yeah, I guess it uh, kind of a mix. I mean, my dad was an entrepreneur himself. Like we're going back to like pagers, right? Like yeah. you know, like a beeper, two way, you know, two way numbers. Back when nights and weekends is when you talk to people on the phone because you didn't have like, <laughs> a voice. Like that's what we're going back to. So that was that's where his kind of entrepreneurial journey had like started, and uh, like I guess that just kind of kind of rubbed off on me, and then. During my time, I also worked as like a, like an EMT for a number of years, and hmm. to do that kind of work, you have to have you have to have a personality. Otherwise, you'll just drown in misery. So, uh, I think a lot of like a lot of my humor and my problem solving skills and and stuff, you know, is, is attributed to to my dad's entrepreneurial journey, and you know, to some of like the jobs that I had in the past between the EMT working in retail, uh, kind of set myself apart. Well, I mean, retail is stressful enough you know, logistics is also pretty stressful, but EMT, I mean, you're, you're engaging with the general public in a very uncontrolled environment during often a crisis. It makes sense. I mean, that, that actually does help. I, the balancing that stress out with humor or being able to, to keep your head on straight has probably served you very well as a founder. Yeah. And it also puts a lot of things in perspective, right? And it's, I try and rub it off on the clients as much as possible. And we're, we're delivering a package. We're delivering lunch to a pharmaceutical rep, right? At the end of the day, if it's, if it's late or something bad happens, we're striving for perfection and imperfect business model, but it's not like someone died. We're not transporting a heart. We're transporting some tacos. So while we want to do it right as often as we can, mistakes are going to happen and it's not worth blowing up over. Right. And that's, that's probably one of the biggest pieces that I've realized is especially in like the founder world and the tech world, like a lot yeah. of people are quick to quick to explode or quick to tirate. And it's like, when you just take a step back and you're like comparatively to other things that could be happening, like this is nothing and we can, we can get through it. Well, you do level up or you broaden or widen your aperture and you see what really matters and what doesn't. I often that only comes through difficulty. What's what's the hardest thing you've ever had to do? In life in general? Yeah. I would say so. We talked about like my dad's entrepreneurial spirit, right? So the toughest thing that I ever had to do was tell the doctors to stop doing CPR on him in the hospital when he had passed away. So like literally had to say like, stop, it's not worth it anymore. And they stopped. I'm so sorry. So no, no, I mean, it's fine. We're going thir 13 years, 13 years, give or take. So but yeah, that would be like in the, in my personal, like my personal yeah. life, all the issues or all the things that have happened, like standing there on the other side of the glass, they're going to town. They're like, this is the seventh time we've done it in the past, like two days, like quality of life will be limited. And I was basically being sold by a physician on like why these people should stop working. And in my mind, I'm like, no, like keep working. Right. Yeah. Like the emotional part of me is like, no, but then the, like the brain part of me, the thought part of me is like. Yeah, like no, it's it's time to call it quits. Like I wouldn't want that. He wouldn't want that. You know. So, were so, were yeah. you an EMT already at that point, or did you do that later on? So you you had. Uh, I mean, th there's so much going on in that moment. This was like right when I start. So twenty, yeah. So this was right when I'd started like the food delivery business. Like I like just went into it. Just quit my job. The like to go on this journey, and then boom. Well, I mean, uh, first again, Chris, I, I thank you for opening up and sharing a, a really difficult chapter in your, your story. I don't want to just gloss over it and be like, "Okay, let's talk about logistics." <laughs> this is this is the real big parts of life, and you're making more and more sense to me as we talk. That one of your superpowers, I think everybody has special gifts that we've been given, and you you have taken all of these ingredients of you know, growing up in an entrepreneurial family and uh, tragedy, along with you know massive risk taking and a, a wonderful sense of humor, and now you're having all of that interact, and you're you're doing it in a as an entrepreneur yourself. I just want to say I'm I'm, I'm just impressed. I, I 
I'm inspired by your past and that you've stuck with what you've been doing for this long. And yeah, I'm, I'm just really honored to help share your story. Yeah. No, thanks, man. Yeah. Then one of our, everybody, you know, every business has core values, right? And one of ours is the cornerstone, in my opinion, the most important to me is transparency. And I always joke, like I have transparency tattooed on my leg. You just can't see it because it's in transparent ink. Right. But I mean, with with my, like with my life personally, with our business, like it's important to be transparent. So what do you, what do you mean by that? When you say transparent, what do you mean? So it all started, transparency started like transparent in earnings, right? And that's okay. where we kind of started as far as wanting to be transparent because if you think like to like the uh, the ride share companies and a lot, it's like, hey, you're going here, but we're not going to tell you where you're going to. We're just going to tell mm. you where to pick up from. Oh, we'll yeah. Tell you where you're going to once you get to where you're supposed to be. Yep. Uh, with a lot of the food apps, like, oh, you'll earn between six and $11 for this. Well, that's a big difference, right? So it started with our tech stack. Like, no, this is where you're going. This is where you're going to end up after that. This is how much money you're making. This is how long we think it's going to take. This is how many miles it is. There is not one piece of information that we have that we don't share with the driver. Because what's the point? We And it ties back to like people like thinking that a gig worker is less. A gig worker is in a sense an independent business. Yes. Now, would you as an independent business say yes to doing work if you didn't know all the details? If someone came to you as a founder and was like, I have this contract for you, but I can't tell you where you're going, exactly how much you're going to make, nor how long it's going to take. Will you sign it? No, you're not going to sign that. But they expect these ICs to do that every single every single day. So it started there. And then it just kind of built as far as like transparency with the team, like internally, this is what we're doing. This is why we're doing it, not just like a direction, but a reason. And same with the driver partners. Like we do monthly engagement events in different cities. So I was just in Indianapolis, put a whole presentation up. This is what we did in revenue last year. This is what we're projecting this year. This is how you can get more orders. Like this is, this is what we're doing and why this is what we're building. Like, because what's the point of hiding any of it? There's nothing special about what we do. The ingredients are all the same tech stack clients, pay drivers and be on time. But the rest of like the rest of the stuff is what we do that makes it special, but anybody can do what we do. We just do it better. And that sounds like it is infused in your culture at this point that that you do have an advantage over the big guys. Yeah. And I mean, we don't, I don't ever want to be as big as DoorDash, right? I don't want to be as big as Uber or any, like the big four, these big couriers, because then it loses that touch. I think a lot of companies, especially like in the logistics and tech, people build a business one of two ways, right? There's the revenue route. I I don't care what I do. I need to 10X my revenue so I can get bought or I can get more money, you know, burn runway, whatever it takes to get that revenue number higher. It doesn't matter on the backs of gig workers. It doesn't matter what the net profit is. And that's the wrong way to build business because like you said earlier, they, they end up hitting a cap because people realize what that business model is. Then there's the other way you can build a business for generational wealth. You know, you look at that, that's the more stereotypical brick and mortar style. I'm going to build it, but I'm going to line my pockets with money, not paying the employees the right way, not treating the workers right. But you're building a business that actually makes money. You just as the owner are putting a lot of it in your pocket. And there's kind of the way that, I mean, I don't want to say we're the only ones doing it, but taking care of the employee, taking care of the gig worker, taking care of the client and doing that in a fiscally responsible manner and sprinkling a little bit of fun on there. And that will create value. And if that value is some company coming along and saying, I want to write you a big ass check, Chris Heffernan, awesome. I will deposit that check. Or if that end result is me having a nice salary and providing a good living to all the people that work and are impacted throughout, like throughout the organization, that's awesome too. We paid $17 million to drivers last year, something like that. Lots of money to drivers. That's the biggest thing to me. Like I love seeing how much money we build clients and how much revenue we've generated. But the biggest things that stand out to me are like we delivered $129 million worth of food commission free to restaurants. And we paid $17 million to drivers. So those drivers were able to pay their bills, support their families, put money into their local communities, those restaurants, the same thing, especially in a business where 
if one of the big companies had delivered $130 million worth of their food, that would come with a $30, 30% haircut off. Mm-hmm. But for us, it mm-hmm. didn't. So those are the metrics that matter the most to me. So I'm going to be in Philadelphia in June for Home Delivery World. Yeah. And I only have one last question for you. It's a dangerous one, though. I don't. I haven't. I, don't, I haven't picked my hotel yet, so I can. I can. I can stay at any hotel in Philadelphia, uh, but I need to know which one uh, you're going. Which cheesesteak place you're going to tell me that I have to order from? I'll I'll use delivered, you know, to place to, to get the order to me. But <laughs> what is the best cheesesteak in Philly? So there's there's a lot of different ones that I love, but I'm gonna go. There's a place in Center City. Um, Angelo's. Not only is it probably the best cheesesteak, they also have probably the best pizza in the city. But no phone in orders, cash only, gotta go. There's always a line, but it is well worth it. Okay, Angelo's, I'm coming for you. Middle or beginning of June. Uh, There's also, if you Google a cheesesteak tour, there's a company that'll take like groups of people and you hit multiple cheesesteak spots and you get like a bite like, you know, a smaller bite of each cheesesteak so you can find, you know, your cheesesteak. Well, I'm, I'm excited that the last time I was in Philly, uh, for a conference, it was the council of supply chain management professionals. This is probably 2006. And, uh, we spent several nights in a row going to the banana leaf restaurant for, for sushi and, and Asian food, uh, with a bunch of logistics nerds like myself, I might have to see if they're still around because that, that was a, that was a great time. Um, and then I, I spent a bunch of time traveling back and forth to Philly uh, for client and branch visits in a, in a prior life. And, uh, but it's, it's been close to 10 years. And so I'm really looking forward uh, to coming back to your hometown, um, getting some good food. We'll have to connect. Uh, I don't know if you'll be at that conference, but if you are, it would be good to, to meet in person. We're rooting for you, Chris. I, I, I like your story a lot. You're so easy to, to chat with. I can see why you've you've been able to build a successful team and um, lead a company doing good business the right way. And I hope you get that big check. I hope you keep taking care of other people. And I, I hope you keep supporting the, the logistics community. Any advice for a, a founder or a future founder who's contemplating, should they make, take the leap or not? Don't do it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> like run far, far away. Do Don't anything do else. Go mine lithium. I, I, I heard that's a thing. Um, no, uh, I was on a podcast once. We use a company called Every to handle our our payments for our drivers. And uh, I was on one of their podcasts recently. I get well, almost like a year ago at this point. And out of nowhere, it was the same question, right? And I came up with this line, and it and it's kind of stuck with us. It's actually like on the wall in our office now, and it's. Uh, automate what you can so you can humanize what's important. So yeah, that's, that's my big, like, that's one of like, one of what has become my tagline. And the other one is like turning the last mile into the extra mile. But, uh, I stick with, I stick with that because there's so many things, especially now with like AI and like automation, don't spend time doing things that, and when I say don't matter, don't matter in the big picture. Right. Yeah. So like, don't spend time focusing too much on assigning orders to to drivers or like running this report or doing stuff like find someone on Upwork that can write some code that can automate these processes for you so you can focus on those, those human interaction points, right? Like humanizing the process and whether that's with your client or with your drivers or anybody, right? But don't, don't focus too much on the mundane. Because that's not that's not what that's not what's going to help you grow. The humanizing part is going to help you grow. That's a great note to end on. We'll have to follow up in a year or so too. I, I want to hear how many markets you've expanded into. I'm in Minneapolis, but I'm I'm a long ways outside of of the city. I want to I want to know how fast you can get me a cheesesteak. <laughs> hey, you're, you're I think you're going to be a good friend to have when it comes to to food. So. Thanks again for sharing your story, Chris, and uh, we'll catch up soon. Absolutely. Appreciate being on. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Bootstrapper's Guide to Logistics. And a special thank you to our sponsors and the team behind the scenes who make it all possible. Be sure to like, follow, or subscribe to the podcast to get the latest updates. To learn more about the show and connect with the growing community of entrepreneurs, 
visit logisticsfounders.com. And of course, thank you to all the founders who trust us to share their stories. 